My name is Asuka Hisa. I am the Director of Learning and Engagement here at ICALA. Uh, welcome to the screening of Full Mantis, being done in conjunction with this beautiful exhibition, Milford Graves, Fundamental Frequency, an exhibition that is dedicated to the life and work of the late interdisciplinary artist, revolutionary Milford Graves, uh, whose experiments spanning music, medicine, and movement, and art explore the cosmic relationship between rhythms and the universe. Uh, the show is co-curated by Mark Chrisman, who's a co-founder of Ars Nova Workshop, and Danielle Jackson, curator of Artists Space in New York, where this show originated. And though you can rent Full Mantis online through Criterion Collection, seeing it tonight here with the work, I know most of you, if not all of you, got a chance to go through the galleries. So seeing it here tonight with the work by Milford Graves in the gallery, the sounds of Milford Graves in the gallery, and hearing from director Jake McGinsky, musician Hugh Glover, and the granddaughter of Milford Graves, Tatiana Graves Kuchutara, is much better. <laughs> we want to get to the screening as soon as possible, so um, I want to hand it to Jake now, uh, who will welcome you too. So thank you for coming. Hey everyone, um, I'm Jake McGinsky, and um, yeah, welcome. I'm not going to say much, but I do just want to remind everyone who's here that um, Tatiana, Milford's granddaughter, Hugh Glover, and I will be here for a Q&A and a, an open conversation after the film. Um, I'm a longtime student of Professor Graves. A lot of us who study with Professor, but also people in Professor's neighborhood refer to him as Prof, so if you hear me say that, that's what I mean. Um, and this film was a labor of love that really grew out of that relationship uh, over the course of 15 years. So um, that's some of the context of the film. Like I was saying to Tatiana, when you do something for that long, the people around kind of, um, they start to wonder if you're ever gonna make a film. So they're just, you're just the person with the camera that hangs out. So it's really special to be here and to watch the film collectively. Um, as Aska said, it's available online now, but it was really created to be watched together with other people in a room. So thanks for being here, and I'll be looking forward to um, being with Hugh and Tatiana and you after uh, for a discussion. And I have some um, short films that I've been working on for the Criterion release that we may be able to look at depending on the way the conversation goes. So please stick around. Thanks. Thank you. So now we're going to have the talk back portion. We have the talk back portion. <laughs> Everyone, Jake McGinsky, Tatiana Graves, Coach Thara, and Hugh Glover. You got the talk, if you guys got the back, we'll do talk back. Um, yeah, so I don't know, does anyone have anything they want to ask or share to start this off? We can all just sit quietly for a while too, yeah. <laughs> Here. Uh, fantastic film, thank you so much, that was, uh, um, I, before walking in here, I, I, you know, ashamedly hadn't heard of Prof, but man, uh, I definitely want to check out all of his stuff now. Uh, it's a fantastic job. But um, uh, got, I got really emotional for the um, autism camp uh, uh, because as a former uh, uh, special ed teacher and working with uh, 
people uh, with autism, it was just, it hit me at a certain core. And it was like, I've done expressive therapy through theater, but seeing something like that, it was just beautifully portrayed. And uh, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that piece of footage is really um, important and crucial and, um, to the film <clears throat> in that, you know, this, the process of this film um, started with just me recording lessons that Prof and I were having and kind of reflecting on them and then Prof asking me to do things like make film um, make a film about the garden for a lecture he was doing, um, or digitize Yara footage. So there's all these different hard drives. Um, but it wasn't until he showed me that footage that it kind of set the bar for like what a cinema, a cinematic um, a kind of treatment of all the material could possibly feel like. And you know, for me, it was like a major cinematic event because it, we were in the basement which is prominently featured in the film and I brought us a eight millimeter projector down he asked me to bring a eight millimeter projector down and he had some reels that he hadn't seen in a while and we strung that one up and it's actually around 18 minutes long in total and we just watched it from beginning to end um, projected onto like a curtain and it was just like watching the transformation between the beginning, middle, and end of like certain children who you saw the camera linger on and they were doing the most like self-soothing behaviors like hair twirling, were the ones who like gravitated closest to the drums, um, especially the kid who was dancing like directly in front of the drum towards the end. And um, it really like uh, painted like the picture of what I already knew from being like with Prof and going to shows that the music was um, not entertainment. It was like a direct transmission of energy and, and healing could be part of that. Uh, so it's interesting in the, the history of editing the film, I wouldn't ever cut that, you know. It always stayed like 18 minutes long. Um, and at a certain point the film was too long and, and I did finally cut it and realized it's still had integrity, but it was like, I felt like I never could touch it because something about that journey from like entering the room to the end, where actually, which is cut, which Prof sometimes would give me, give me a hard time about, why didn't you leave that in there, Jake, you know? <laughs> the, the kids actually get on the drums and start playing, and you can see it now in some of the museum exhibitions, right? It's, I think it's here in, in its totality, but... Um, yeah, that was a special one, special one for me too. And it was the first time we sat together and watched a piece of archival and then just talked about it. And that's where that audio comes from. Um, you know, an interesting thing about all the archival is it wasn't a, there wasn't a like archival process in the film. Like everything that you see that's from the past is just stuff that Prof gave me in the house or that we, we digitized together or discovered together. Um, so there wasn't a research like element to like finding things. The only clip that I had to get and find was the Middleheim footage, um, the black and white footage that Hughes uh, prominently featured in. Um, and that was just because Prof told me to go get it. He was like, that, that's a, that band, you need to find that footage. It's in an archive. And it took us a while because the Belgian archive was like, has like an old Flemish section and stuff, but it, it was an instruction from Prof to go find it. So like, um, I think about that in the film that there's lots of archival now that's come out too in the process of some of these exhibitions, but like in Full Mantis, it was kind of what Prof was, was sharing at the time. Yeah. Um, so I'll start from the beginning. I was just curious because in the film there's um, a lot of replications of the human body in the meridian system. Um, was he a, and he talked about the herbs out in his garden or his grandfather's house garden. Um, was he a, a herbalist or acupuncturist as well? Okay, cool. I figured, cause, but I was just. You? Yeah, you take that one. I'll follow you. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, yeah, he was a practicing acupuncturist and herbalist, and and taught um, classes on herbalism in his in his house. Um, yeah, there's some. I think there's some acupuncture footage here, and some herbalism footage here. Not so much in Full Mantis, but in some of the museum exhibitions. Case I was diagnosed with stenosis, fourth and fifth lumbar. A well-known surgeon is going to operate on my back, put the hinges there. I went to Milford and told him, hey man, they're going to operate on me. I don't know. What's going to happen? He said, come to my basement, lay out there. He put the needles either side of my spinal nerve, hooked them up to the German vote, which provides small scale electric energy in the needles. He did that over a period of time. I never had the surgery. <laughs> no, hold on. I do more than that. <laughs> He was uh, one of two who took the Chinese-directed acupuncture course. The guy who scored with him, number one, wanted Milford to come to his medical center in North Carolina to do acupuncture. Milford said to me when I said, how come you didn't go? He said, man, I, I took acupuncture and decided that it was the way to serve my people, the way the Chinese serve their people with their country doctors. That's the kind of man Milford is. Oh, hi there, um, over here. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I just want to like, briefly name a really strong connection point for me in the film in thinking on just cosmic synchronicity is in like this notion that I've sat with for a really long time of like ear training, of, of training the ears to hear something beyond what we normally perceive as like sensible. And, and it seems as though Milford is dealing almost with the body training in this, in this training of his, his body to be able to engage with this cosmic space that we are in. I, I'm really, inspired by it and, and have a, sort of a question, especially for Hugh and, and Tatiana and thinking about the body and, and Milford's presence. I, I, I was almost just thinking so much about his gait, the way that he walks and, and how it evidences that, that synchronization. Um, and if there was anything that you could speak to in that. And additionally, Hugh, you spoke a little bit yesterday about yoga and, and that, that it, it's relevance in your practice and just thinking about how, you know, we, we think with our whole bodies, but we also are capable of speaking with our whole bodies in a certain way. And if there was anything in, in your, you know, background with yoga or, or else outside of that, that really informs how you've been able to navigate your relationship with your practice. Yeah. Do you mind um, repeating the question just to make sure that I'm yeah, 
just thinking about Milford's presence and his walking and just his just bodily presence. It, it, was there anything in your relationship with him that really like helped evidence just in, even in his bodily presence, his relationship to like the cosmos, his relationship to that synchronizing force that he seems to be dealing with, or am I off there maybe? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind for me is he took his time. Um, that was his way of taking up the space that he owned. Um, and that was just present in all of his life, you know, not just in his, his art and his work. Um, That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing I could say. Um, and the way he spoke, the way he ate, the way he walked. Um, very intentionally took his time. Yeah, yeah. And you could tell that he enjoyed everything a lot more because of it. He did not like to rush. He did not like to rush, and that was a, that was always a, <laughs> a, a comment from someone, from someone, especially in the family, of just like he take, I, <laughs> I come over and he'd be like, hey Todd, uh, can you come down here for a second, and we'll just be, you know, stopping by to say hi and making sure they don't need anything or, um, you know, dropping something off, and as soon as he said that, my mom knew. It's going to take two hours at least. <laughs> it's going to take two hours. And, and so my mom would be like, hey, hey, Pops, um, we got we to go somewhere after this. So, you, you know, he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Only 15 minutes. <laughs> two hours would pass by and we're, we're talking back and forth about, you name it. You really, you name it. And, you know, my, my grandma would be like, hey, Mel. Be like, what? She'd be like, the girl's got to go. He's like, yeah, 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 15 more minutes. <laughs> but that, that's, that's what makes him him. That's why we love him. That's, that's why I love him. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm curious particularly to hear from Hugh about what it was like to be a musician with him. Like, how did he collaborate or bring other artists into the world that he was living and playing inside of? Uh, how much time do we have? I spent 60 years with this guy. Uh, I'll try to hit yeah, the... Yeah, 15 minutes. <laughs> First time we met, uh, Milford was playing with Giuseppe Logan. Uh, there's an album out on ESP well, you'd have to look it up. Giuseppe Logan Quartet, that one. The quartet. And before meeting him, I was a piano player. Uh, not bad. I mean, I was at the five spot when Monk was there. Um, Bud came in. Monk had Johnny Griffin playing with him, tenor saxophonist. Bud Powell came in, said to Monk, peanuts. Monk got up, went in the back of five spot. Bud sat down at the piano. He 
played maybe a minute. He gets up and walks out of the five spot. So they're playing a the blues. I go to the piano and sit down and start to play. Roy Haynes was playing drums at that time. And Roy and I hit it off uh, in a way that I hadn't felt from a drummer. Okay. When I met Milford, he was playing at the October Revolution in jazz with Giuseppe. And he played so fast, similar to what you've seen. Now, this is going back 60, 1962. Nobody was, they were drum roll, but nobody was keeping t time with the sense of swing going at so I'm keeping time. I'm used to. Mm, mm, mm. I couldn't. To the extent that I had a headache, I never get headaches. If anything, I feel empowered. So we start to talk. I said, man, you know, this is the first time I got a headache from listening to you. And he said, you. Well, you didn't know my name. He said, hey, man, you got to give up. Because I said I had background and studied Juilliard, Manhattan, all the music schools in the city. And he said, you got to give it up. And I'm saying, give it up? And I just sat in with Johnny Griffin. <laughs> so I went home. And we maintained contact from that time. Now, you talk about, well, how did we get along? Basically, we were on a similar quest. He was uh, going towards uniting all those aspects that involved, he was a athlete, ran middle distance, was very good at it. Um, was in the pen relays, I think, during high school. Yes. Uh, he was a Golden Glove boxer, had done very well in that as well. Uh, you could see it. When the guys are doing Yara, he, he starts to throw, and you notice the guy's trying to kick him all over here. He's punching down and catching those kicks before they ever touch. Plus his mind. Uh, it was a mind that was always questioning everything. I mean, well, I even questioned language. I said, why are we speaking English? Why is this the best language for us to speak? Suppose there's something out in space that is speaking something greater than English. So we were both questioning and not taking any assumptions about anything except the feeling, the sense that you can rely on your intuition plus your analysis. I'm just using my words. He didn't differentiate. What is the question? Get the answer. When you looked at the when he had the, what was it, uh, anodes, or cathodes, or whatever you call them, stuck on his chest and stuff. That was a result of questioning 
when you see in the exhibit all the blah, 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 all the graph stuff, that stuff wasn't in place until Milford went about systematically putting his body through you know what, staying up without any sleep to create truth tables, to make sure the circuit, oh, the circuit goes from this point to this point. Well, it reaches this point. Is that a point that it can go further? Does it have to go in a di different direction? Or does it go back? Or does it negate? All of that he had to contend with to get it to the point that when put it on the body, it would be in sync with the functioning going on in the body. Even on top of that, because he knew organic rhythms. What is organic rhythms? Well, it's certain a marching, dun, 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 dun. and it certainly wasn't confined to chang, chang, ka chang. You could see he's messing with the garden. Mother Nature provided some rhythms. He looked in the sky. He could see that there was a certain rhythm. We were looking at uh, Gurdjieff, uh, and the, uh, what's his name, who was like his his editor or interpreter and so forth. And when we realize planet frequencies are sending signals back and forth, I said, man, we're not playing for y'all to get up and go, dun, dun. no, we got to play. So those frequencies in the planets are interacting and telling us, yeah, swing, go ahead, go ahead. Thank Answer you. Answer your question. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Would you guys want to see a, a short, unreleased film? Yeah. Okay. So, um, this film is, is uh, you know, after Full Mantis came out, I kept filming. And um, this film comes out of that period, which is 2018 to 2020. This is Prof's second to last uh, concert in his neighborhood of Jamaica, Queens at the Jamaica Arts Center. And um, it was a beautiful show. Uh, Prof was surrounded by a lot of his longtime Yara practitioners and his family and friends and uh, folks from the neighborhood who came out. And um, yeah, it's a it was a beautiful it was a beautiful show. We can talk more about it after if folks want to stick around. It's about nine minutes. Did you say? Yeah, it's about nine minutes. All right. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, Hugh. Thanks, everyone.